Um, real quick, before we get into the message, um, I, I feel, I, I just felt burdened to address what's going on in Israel and the Middle East. And I know it's a, a, a humongous deal. Church, we need to be praying for Israel and for all involved. We need to be fervently praying. But I've been asked a lot over this last week from a biblical standpoint, what's going on? Why is this happening? What does this mean? Is this the end times? It's probably the question I get most, okay? And so I want to address a little bit of that. So you're going to get a mini sermon, and then you're going to get the real sermon. Are you guys okay with that? That's good. Okay. So Israel, why, why are they fighting? Why are we having issues? Where does this come from biblically? I've been asked that this week. Well, many, many, many years ago, we had Abraham and Sarah. God promised them a son. They were really, really old. And God said, hey, I'm going to give you a son. We're going to have a nation come up out of you. And then it didn't happen right away. And a few weeks ago, we talked about forbearance, patience. And they became impatient. So Sarah said, hey, you should take my servant, my handmaiden, Hagar, and maybe that's what God means by he's going to give you a son. I'm really old. I can't give you one. And Abraham was like, well, okay, you know, and so he did. And so they had Ishmael. That was not the promised chosen son. Well, then sometime after that, Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had the 12 sons, and that's where we have the 12 tribes of Israel, and that's where we get Israel from. So ever since then, we have the nation of Ishmael, which is believed to be the Arab race, and Israel in conflict with each other. And we look at this in, in an American uh, context, and we're like, you know, oh my goodness, this is new. This is not new. This has been happening since the very beginning. This is really bad. This is, this is a conflict that has been a struggle for the entire time that Israel has been a family to a nation. And so, again, we need to be praying for them, but there's I've been asked a lot of other questions, and if you look on the news, you'll see a lot of protests, you'll see a lot of anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian uh, protests and things, and so I've been asked a lot about that too, and I wanted to speak into that a little bit, not to give you my opinion, not to give you an opinion on a specific uh, news channel that you can watch, but to give you an actual biblical perspective. So in case you're struggling with this, or maybe more likely people are asking you, what's the big deal about Israel? Should they give them that land? What's going on? They shouldn't defend themselves. I want to speak into that a little bit today. Now, the, granted, it's, today is going to be very clear, but I want you to know where I stand, where Island Community Church stands, and more importantly, where God's Word stands. To do that, I want to read a post that my friend uh, Pastor Travis Johnson wrote. Um, it, this was way better than I could put into words, so I figured I would just steal his and give him the credit for it. Uh, but he's a pastor. He's got uh, uh, now multiple churches out in Mobile, Alabama. Great, great, great guy. He used to live down here uh, and pastor LifePoint Church up in Homestead. But I want to read what he says. It's a little bit lengthy, and then I've got some scripture to go along with it. So he says, no moral equivalencies. If you cannot unequivocally condemn Hamas for... Now, I'm going to cut out a few of the things that he wrote in there because I know we still have some small ears in here, okay? But you've seen what's happening on TV. Those are actual reports. People are claiming, no, that didn't really happen. Those are actual reports. The worst atrocities that you can imagine. So he lists a few of those and I'll get into them, and the parading of their bodies around through the streets, mass kidnapping, slaughter of hundreds of festival goers, executions of the elderly. If you can't condemn all that, then something is seriously wrong. Lose the moral equivalency. Condemn it, denounce it, reject it. This slaughter of infants and innocent Jews by Hamas is done in the same fervor of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the Nazis. 
with the backdrop of the greatest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, the vitriol against the Jews in the streets should be flatly condemned. Imagine marches in support of ISIS after they beheaded Coptic Christians on the Libyan seashore, marches in support of the Nazis after they gassed the Jews. Unconscionable. I've also seen some leaders calling for de-escalation. I've seen condemnations of Israel going into Gaza. No. Israel should drive out Hamas. The world should rout Hamas where they are found and as has been done with ISIS. Further, asking Israel to stand down after such a horrific atrocity against innocence is appeasement and injustice and an invitation to more ethnic cleaning. Israel not only has a right to defend their land, Israel has an obligation to protect their innocence. Israel is the homeland of the Jews. They have survived Babylonian captivity, Egyptian slavery, German Holocaust, and hundreds of years of conquest. Now listen to this part. This is fascinating. This is what's really going to bring context into place here. They now have 8,100 square miles of land that define their current national borders. 8,100. You ready for this? Their promised boundaries, and this is in Scripture, and I'll give you some references here in a minute. Their promised boundaries were 300,000 square miles. And some leaders would see it as controversial to support Israel, her peace, her innocence, her promise as she holds this limited space as home. I pray Israel goes in successfully and wipes out Hamas and defeats this terrible threat from the terrorists who have done these terrible things. I pray for the peace of Israel. Peace is not that Israel would fearfully acquiesce to those who would slaughter her innocent civilians. I pray for the kind of peace that comes because this terrible threat to Israel and to all of humanity has been vanquished. Very, very well written. So let me give you some scriptures here. Genesis 15, 18, we're not going to look at them on the screen, but Genesis 15, 18, and Joshua 1, 4, both of those references, they tell about the borders from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates. You know the Nile is in Egypt, and the Euphrates is all the way on the other side of Iraq. That was the promised land. That is the promised land to Israel. So in case there's any question, I've got a verse for that, okay? Now, let me address in Psalms where this psalmist is addressing, hey, God, there is people coming against your people, your nation, and ultimately you. And the psalmist doesn't pander around. The psalmist is very, very, very clear. This is Psalm 83, verses 1 through 5, and then 13 through 18. It says, Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. Larry and I were just talking about this earlier. This is not a land battle. This is an evil versus God battle. Through and through, 100%. It says, they have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. That's exactly what we're hearing on the news, isn't it? Down to verse 13, Psalm 83 says, oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest, and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever." Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. 
I think scripture is very clear of what's happening. Do we need to pray for the innocent Palestinian people? Absolutely. I've been there twice. When you stay in Bethlehem, yes, oh little town of Bethlehem, that is Palestine. That is the West Bank. That, that is a very, very Christian uh, Arab city. They're very, very sweet people. So we need to pray for those people too. But for the people who are going against Israel and ultimately against God, again, evil against God, just as scripture says, that evil needs to be destroyed. So if any questions, feel free to come and ask me afterwards. I wanted to make it clear, number one, to ask you guys, please be praying fervently for Israel and all of those involved. But number two, this is where I stand, this is where Island Community Church stands, and I believe this is where God's word stands. Everybody clear on that? Okay, cool. Galatians chapter 5. I'm not going to read through the whole thing because I know I took a bunch of time there, but I do want to just go down to verse 22. Sorry, I know you're going to have to skip through a bunch of those, Zach. Uh, Verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and this week is Fruit of the Spirit Part 10, how to be, last week was how to be more attractive, and I didn't know where to go from, from there, so t- this, today, this week or today is how to be even more attractive. I don't know, that's as, cr- that's as creative as I could get, so my apologies. I was going to wear a suit. Actually, I had to recently buy a suit, imagine that, um, and uh, I've got a couple of real important weddings coming up, and, uh, but I didn't go get it yet. It was being kind of fitted and everything, but I was thinking about wearing the suit, but I just didn't get it, so you got a button up today, okay? All right, here we go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, and now here we are on our second week of kindness, talking about kindness how to be more attractive by being more kind. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> my apologies, I still have this cough, so if I just start coughing, just, just, just whatever. It might happen, it might not happen, we'll see. First Thessalonians 5.15, we, we read this verse last week, and this is an important verse to see because it makes sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive, that's one of my favorite words, always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. That's that, that do what is good thing is kindness. We're striving to do what is kind, and the context of this verse is when people are doing evil to us, when people are wronging us, we need to be kind back. Now, so how to be even more attractive? That's what we're talking about, right? Here's the big deal, is that most of us spend way more time and effort trying to look nice than trying to be nice. You can go forward a few slides there, Zach. Most of us try to spend way more time and effort trying to look nice than trying to be nice. And we often spend more time on our appearance than our attitude. And I think most of us are guilty of this. We spend all the time in the mirror and getting ready, and we want you to do those things. We said last week, especially brush your teeth before you come to church. Please do that, okay? Brush your hair, all of that good stuff. But oftentimes we forget to wash our hearts, to wash the insides of ourselves, and to be clean there. And remember we said we'd rather work with an office full of average looking people that are the kindest, sweetest, most generous people, we'd rather do that than work in an office full of extremely attractive people, but just we're meanies, just we're just bad people. We would way rather work with just average looking people, but we put all of our focus oftentimes on our outward appearance. And we had that cheat code to life. If you want to look nice, be nice. Cheat code. Like if you want to look nice, which we all do, be nice. 
because that shines more than anything else. And so just to be clear, what's the best way to describe kindness? We said this last week and we're moving on. Kindness is love, which we know love is a verb, not a noun. It's something that you do, not something that you have. So it's love being put into practice for the benefit of someone else. That's what kindness is. It's in this outward display of putting into practice that love of doing things for people, of seeing people's needs and meeting those needs, doing what we can to serve those people. So last week, we quickly read through the story of the Good Samaritan. And we all know this story very, very well. We could, you know, probably all come up here and and tell it. We might have our own little versions of the story. But one of the things that I love about Scripture is that every time you read it, it will give you something different. And when I read this story a, a few weeks ago when I first started looking into it, just stuff started jumping off of the pages at me that I was like, this is an amazing message that I think God wants us to hear. So Luke chapter 10, I want us to turn there. Luke chapter 10, real quick as you're turning there, I'll give you the brief synopsis on the Jews versus Samaritans. This was a huge feud. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. The Jews saw Samaritans as lower than human, like like animals, like disgusting, dirty, filthy, unclean. They saw them as half-breeds. Many of them were half-Jew, half-something else. They didn't see them as people. And, and whenever a Jew would see a Samaritan, they would, they would distance themselves from that Samaritan. And that's the relationship that they had. You can actually still now go in Israel, in the West Bank, and there's a couple of Samaritan settlements, villages that have been there since basically the beginning. And you can go uh, visit them. They're still there. So, all right, here we go. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, at that point, dude should have just kept his mouth shut. And he had to just, just pry a little bit. But, but there's, a, there's a very specific reason. He was trying to figure out a way to not make everyone his neighbor. What's it called when we try to find a shortcut in something uh, and so that we don't have to do the right thing? What's that called? A loophole. He was trying to find a loophole in the law. And by the way, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That was this prayer that they would say repeatedly over and over and over. And, and I mean, they would know that inside and out, no questions asked. And he's trying to find a loophole into that. Verse 30, and as, as Jesus often did, when he was asked a question, he'd do one of two things. He would either ask a question back and put the burden of proof on them, or he would tell a story. And that's what he does here. Verse 30, he says, in reply... Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, when it says going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's exactly what it means. Jerusalem is kind of up here, kind of at the top of the mountains, and then very shortly after, it goes down to the desert over to the Dead Sea. So when it's talking about going down, it really was going down these pretty treacherous mountains, and it was desert. Because to the, uh, the west, you would have all of this fertile ground. You have the Mediterranean Sea, and you have Israel coming through, and it was all green, very, very fertile ground. And then you had Jerusalem, and the rain and the clouds would pretty much stop there. And they wouldn't normally go 
passed that down. And so to the east, it's just desert. And this road that he is talking about is a very, very uh, treacherous road. It's, it's mountains, dry, rocky, blazing hot sun. It was very, very dangerous. Like, like robbers and thieves would, would be stationed there. And if it was just a very small caravan or maybe an individual, oftentimes those individuals would get robbed. And so when Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, they would know exactly what road they were talking about. It's actually, it's an 18-mile stretch, which is funny. They have an 18-mile stretch. We have an 18-mile stretch. (laughs) They're pretty much the same thing, okay? So they would know exactly where Jesus was talking about. Jesus was so good when he tells stories to paint these vivid pictures in our minds. And so we, we got to understand um, what this road looks like. So actually, go ahead and, and put that picture up there. See the, see the little road that kind of comes down there? That's, that's part of the actual road. Now, it wasn't all exactly like that. Some places were a little wider, but that's pretty much it. So that's a, not a great area to be stuck out there by yourself, is it? So, back to verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, when it says, leaving him half dead, that means they left him for dead. That means this guy had no shot. There was no water, they, they beat him half to death, and nobody was coming to help this guy. He was stuck out in the desert, bleeding out, baking in the sun, naked, no water, to die. This guy was on his way out. So then we have three new characters that enter into the story. We all know we've got a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan, and they walk into a bar and they say, ow. You didn't think I'd go there, did you? A priest, a Levite, and Samaritan. I'll hear about that one later. So we have three characters. And with these three characters, we see three possible attitudes in opportunities for kindness. Each of these characters in this story represent a different attitude that we can have when we are presented with an opportunity to show kindness. Number one, ignore the circumstance. We're really, really, really good at this, aren't we? When we see an opportunity for kindness, when we see somebody that's in need, when we see somebody that needs help, what do we do oftentimes? We ignore it. What do they say? Out of sight, out of mind, right? Here's, here's how we do it. And, I, you know, actually, I... I True confessions of a pastor. I've caught myself doing this recently. Uh, uh, Certain circumstance, I won't give all the gory details. Here's how we manifest this. We don't make eye contact. Right? You ever ever been there? Oftentimes, it's in Miami. And and a lot of times when you're at a a big stoplight, and like, like, I always picture like, you know where 878 comes and and you get right on US 1 there up close to Dadeland Mall, there's always people asking for money and they have signs and everything. Um, And what do you do? You like you you like this. They're they're standing right there. They're staring at you, and if you don't make eye contact, they don't see you. Right? It's like like a like a a preschooler. They want to play hide and go seek, and they do this. Right? You can't see me. Right? We do that. We, we ignore the circumstance. We act like they're not even there. And that's what happened here in this first time. So here's a question for you. In opportunities of kindness, do you ignore the opportunity? And notice I'm calling it an opportunity because it is an opportunity to serve. It is an opportunity to love people. It is an opportunity to, to be a neighbor to someone. So verse 31 a priest, which, I mean, if anybody should stop and help, right? It's a man of God, right? A priest happened to be going down the same road, 
And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He just completely ignored it. He's like, nope, nope, not my problem, nope. So here's a big question for you. Are your problems and responsibilities always more important than people and relationships? I'll let that one sit in for a minute. How often do we allow our problems and our responsibilities to supersede people and relationships? You know what I'm really glad about? I'm glad that God doesn't think this way because you think God has a little more responsibility than we do, probably just a wee bit, right? He's got the whole world in his hand, right, that whole deal, but what does he do? What's his most important creation? It's us. We are. So three attitudes in an opportunity for kindness. Number one, we ignore the circumstance. Number two, we inquire about the situation. We inquire about the situation, but oftentimes, that's where it stops. That's all we do is we inquire. It's acting like you care without action showing you care. It's taken a little bit of a step, but just to find out what's going on and then just kind of not having a burden enough to do anything about it. This reminds me of a phrase that's pretty popular right now. It's called virtue signaling. It's a really, really popular thing to make ourselves look like we're so concerned about something. In fact, here's the definition of virtue signaling. The expression of a conspicuous, self-righteous, moral viewpoint with the intent of communicating good character. So what are you doing? Oh, that's so important to me. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm all about that. But there's really nothing that's backing it up. Remember, kindness is love or action being put into practice for the benefit of others. So verse 32, it says, so too, a Levite, and a Levite would have been someone of the priestly line, so they would have been somebody who worked in the church or the the synagogue or the temple. So it says, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, when you read that, you're like, okay, that sounds just like the first guy. But I put up there the New King James Version, which gives us a little bit more insight. Now, I don't know 100% if this is what Jesus was trying to do, but this is how it's said in the New King James. It, it, it still makes the point. New King James says, likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. So it gives this picture of the Levite seeing somebody over there and, and, and oh, dude, man, right? And then just walking away. He acted like he was concerned, but he was really more concerned for himself just to kind of know what was happening. Kind of, we do it nowadays called rubbernecking, right? Kind of the same thing. I I love the phrase, and I say this all the time, your walk talks, or your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. That putting feet to your faith, doing action, speaks so much louder than just your words. There was a movie several years ago, Jerry Maguire, and I am not condemning nor condoning this movie. I'm just making a statement about a scene in the movie. And Jerry Maguire was a sports agent. And he lost all of his clients but one. I mean, his whole life was basically going down the tubes. And he was trying to convince this this one football player, Rod Tidwell, that he should stick with him. And and he's going, Jerry, like my house is falling apart. Like I've got nothing. Like nobody knows who I am. Like like I'm just a free agent. I might get cut. And he's he's making all these things and he's getting Jerry Maguire worked up. He's like, you want to be my agent? And he's using some other stuff in there too. You want to be my agent? You want to do it? What do you say? Show me the money. Come on. Show me the money. Put your money where your mouth is. 
And see, that's what we are called to do. Not just talk about it, not just inquire about it, but put feet to our faith. Show me the money. So three attitudes and an opportunity for kindness. Number one, we can ignore the circumstance. Number two, we can inquire about the situation. And number three, here's the one that we ought to do. Involve yourself in the solution. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And I started thinking about this verse. And, and, and at first, I kind of had a problem with that word pity because we often make that word a negative thing. And so I was thinking, what, what does pity really mean? What, 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 what does it really truly mean that he took pity on him? Well, pity, the definition is sympathetic sorrow for one suffering, distressed, or unhappy. That's what pity is. So I started thinking about sympathy. It's having sympathy for someone. So then I started, and this is how my mind works, I started breaking down that word. Now, I've told you guys this before. Um, when I want to kind of teach something to Isla, my nine-year-old, uh, oftentimes I will do so in a way that takes way longer than it should, okay? And so, but I, I kind of um, learned this way in school. And so when I was thinking of sympathy, I was like, okay, what exactly does that word mean? Well, I can break down that word into the prefix, the root, and the suffix. And pretty much if you know some of those prefixes, roots, and suffixes, you can understand what words are, it, it, even when you've not even really heard them before. So I was thinking sympathy, sim, together, the same, path, or pathy, pathos, feeling, suffering. So sympathy is actually having or adapting the same feelings or being together with someone on their feelings or their suffering. It's inserting ourselves into that situation to burden ourselves with the way that they feel. That's what sympathy is. That's what having true pity on someone is. And I wrote this down. Kindness comes natural when you insert yourself into the same circumstance or need or pain as others. If you want to be a kind person, if you're like, yeah, you know what, this doesn't come natural for me, I struggle with this at times, like I, I probably ought to be a more kind person, you need to insert yourself into that situation. You need to feel what they're feeling. You need to feel their pain, their suffering, whatever it is that they're going through. And when we do that, when it's like, oh, what if that was me? I would want somebody to step up and bless me or be kind to me or at least just say a kind word or make eye contact or whatever it is. That's what we would want. So we've got to involve ourselves in solution. So that's not the end of the message. That's the why. Why? But I need to give you a how. I need to really give you some application, some, something to understand. Okay, is there anything more from this story of the Good Samaritan that we can look at and say, what are the steps that he took? What, what, what are the attitudes that this guy had, this Good Samaritan? And is there anything that maybe we can adapt from him and apply in our lives? And when I started thinking this way, I just read through a few verses, and God just started pulling stuff out of there that I have never seen before. This was so cool. So we have found seven steps of kindness from a Samaritan. So here we go. Real fast, we're going to just breeze through them. Here is where we put our feet to faith. Here is where we dig in and we learn how to actually do something and how to do it. So here we go. Seven steps of kindness from a Samaritan. Number one, suspend judgment. We have to suspend judgment because we often look at people and we judge them. 
And that's why we don't step in and help. Verse 33, it says, but a Samaritan. And, and, and I cannot stress this enough. When Jesus said those three words in this story, there would have been a gasp among the crowd. Because they would have known, okay, we had two guys that already passed up this guy that was left for dead. And then when he said, but a Samaritan, everyone knew this was going to be the guy that was going to help him out. And everyone was, was focused on this guy that was left for dead was a Jew. And when Jesus says, but a Samaritan, they would have been, no way. There's no possible way a Samaritan was going to stop and help that guy. No way. They would have gasped. Why? Because there was such a divide. And church, we have got to break that down. We have to suspend judgment on all people because you know what? For God so loved just America and Israel? No. For God so loved the world. We are not any more special than anyone else, although we would love to think we are. So number one, seven steps of kindness from a Samaritan. Number one, suspend judgment. Number two, probably my favorite here, see people in their problems, not as their problems. It's good, right? See people that they are in the middle of a problem, but what do we do? We often see them as their problem. Verse 33 again, but a Samaritan as he traveled came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he saw the man. He didn't see his problem. He saw a man, just like you and just like me. But oftentimes, we see people as their problems because we say, oh, he's a mess. Oh, she's a disaster. Oh, she, she, like, he always has problems. She's always in the middle of drama. You know anybody like that that's always in the middle of drama? If you don't, it's probably you. Okay? <laughs> See people in their problems, not as their problems. Number three, and we kind of already covered this one, sympathize. Sympathize. Put yourself into that position. It says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. That's that insert yourself into the situation. What if that was me? I would certainly want someone to stop and help me. What if I was in need? What if I was hurting? I would want somebody to just stop and talk to me. Sympathize with people. Number four, step into their mess. Step into their mess. We, we oftentimes will help, but it's almost like, uh, you know, we don't really want to get too much involved in it, but church, we've got to step into their mess. Verse 34, it says, he went to him. Notice he didn't you know, take his water jug, you know, he probably had a Yeti or, or one of those, right? And, and he just, you know, throw, threw it out over to him and maybe, you know, threw him, flicked him a couple of coins. Hope everything works out, bro. He didn't do that. He went to him to take care of him, step into their mess. Number five, serve those in need. This is a big one. I, 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 love the concept of serving. I'm not great at it, but I love that Jesus so much calls us to serve. Because guess what? Isn't that really, honestly, what Jesus did? He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we need to serve those in need. You know what, church? This is uncomfortable. This costs us something. This gets us a little bit dirty and messy. Yep. I'm so glad that my Jesus was willing to get dirty and messy for me. Amen? Serve those in need. Verse 34 again, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. That Why did he do that? That would have been the only antiseptic that they had. He was trying to get him cleaned up. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. 
Church, we've got to get out of our comfort zones, and we need to serve those in need. Number six, sustain care when necessary. Sustain care. Keep up on it. Keep going. So sometimes, yes, sometimes it's a one and done thing, but oftentimes it's not. Sometimes we need to step into their mess. We need to serve them, and we need to continue to serve them, continue to meet with them, continue to give them time and love and effort or support or whatever it is that God's calling you to do. We've got to sustain care when necessary. Verse 35, it says, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. That was a big deal. Two denarii, a a denarii was about a day's wages back then. So this guy pulls out hundreds of dollars, would be equivalent to us, gives them to the innkeeper, who he probably knew, and yes, this was just a story, but this guy probably traveled this road often, and he was, this was probably his trade route. That's probably where he stayed there. And he said, hey, you know me. You know I'm good for it. You know I've got it. I want you to take, this, take care of this guy. If, if he needs more care, let me know. I'll handle it. I'll take care of it. You know I'll be back through here again. I will take care of you to take care of him. So we need to sustain care when necessary, not just a one and done thing. And number seven, this one's so clear in scripture, see everyone as your neighbor. See every single person as your neighbor. Verse 36 and 37, it says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Now, what do you realize about that? What what did he not say? Samaritan. He couldn't even bring himself to say that word. Man, you think Jesus knows how to cut to the heart? You think Jesus knows how to make a very, very clear point? And Jesus was saying, you know, those people that you hate so badly, that's the guy that stopped and helped the Jew. Now, you tell me who your neighbor is. He said, well, I I, I guess it's the guy that had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Church, we are called to be the church. Church. Not the island community church, not the group of people that meets here on a Sunday morning, the church that goes outside of these doors and loves and serves people in a way that it just points to Jesus. We are called to be kind people. That is a fruit of the Spirit that just needs to be coming out of us. Some of you, you, you've got this on lock. Like, you are so good at this. I, I, I know some of the people here are some of the most kind and generous people that I know. Others of us, it doesn't come natural. So how do we do it? Seven steps of kindness from a Samaritan. Number one, suspend judgment. Number two, see people in their problems, not as their problems. Number three, sympathize. Number four, Step into their mess. Number five, serve those in need. Number six, sustain care when necessary. And number seven, see everyone as your neighbor. Church, if you want to be a more attractive person, we've got to be kind. We've got to love people and we've got to serve people just like Jesus did. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you were so kind to us. And God, we don't deserve anything that we have. God, what we deserve is is hell. Because we have sinned against a holy God. But you are so full of grace. 
God, your word said it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Not fear, not guilt. We know, we look at Jesus. Jesus never dealt in those things. But God, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Leads us to understand that we have sinned against you, Lord. We have messed up. Eternally messed up. (laughs) And that we need a savior. So right here in this moment, if you know that you need a savior, maybe you've been counting on religion. Maybe you've been counting on your good works. Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. No righteous people. Maybe you've been counting on your family's faith. Right now, this morning, would you just put your full faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone? Would you say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I trust that you died on a cross for me and rose again three days later. Thank you for that sacrifice. I give you my life, Lord. Save me. Change me. If you said that this morning for the first time that you decided to give your life to Jesus, I would love to know about it. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. Would you just slip your hand up? Say, I got it right today. I gave my life to Jesus today. I'm not going to call you out or cause any attention. I'd just love to pray for you. Jesus, thank you so much that you are good and that you are kind and that all throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New, we can see the goodness and the kindness of God. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for being so kind to us. God, help us to be kind to others as you have called us to be, as you have given us the example in Jesus to be. God, we pray for this time of offering. Help us to be generous. And God, help us to love and serve this community and this world in a way like never before. We pray all of this in the awesome and amazing name of Jesus. Amen.